Welcome back to the channel and in this video I will be sharing how I turned this empty 18 by 18 by 24 exoterra terrarium into this beautiful bioactive tropical paradise for my adult crested gecko. She is getting big and is in need of an upgrade from this 10 gallon enclosure she is currently living in. So I hope you enjoy this video of a much needed gecko upgrade project. But anyways, let's get into it. First, I brought the empty enclosure into my living room so I would have more space to work on this project. The first step is to create a naturalistic backdrop for the enclosure. So I tilted the enclosure down onto the floor. Next, I had to go into my closet to gather all the supplies for the background. And most of these supplies I got from the reptile show, so check out my previous video. I then carried all of the supplies from my room into the living room. Now that I had all the supplies ready, I can get started. To make the background, cork bark flats are needed. I got a good deal on this cork bark, so I have multiple pieces to choose from. I also have a few manzanita branches that I may incorporate into the background as well. Next up, I unlocked the enclosure and opened the front opening doors all the way so I can have access to the back of the tank. Now I will grab various cork bark flats and arrange them onto the background until I find a configuration that I like. This step can be a little tricky and take a bit of time, but it is important not to rush, so you end up with something cohesive. I also did the same thing with the branches, however, I didn't end up incorporating them into the background because they might have been too heavy. So this is the configuration of cork that I ended up with. I then took the cork bark out of the enclosure so I can start constructing the background. First, I needed silicone. This silicone must be 100% waterproof and pet safe. I also needed a caulking gun in order to squeeze the silicone out of the tube. The silicone will be placed level to the door line and above. But first I put on gloves to protect my hands from the silicone as well as put on a mask to avoid inhaling any fumes. If you didn't know, most silicone has a very strong scent of vinegar. Now that I am safe, we can load the caulk gun and get to work. Here I am spreading a generous amount of silicone onto the glass of the background, making sure to get everything covered. Next I spread the silicone out with my hands to make sure all of the background was covered. As you can see, gloves are important to keep your hands from getting sticky. Now that the silicone is applied, it has to dry before the next step. In the meantime, we can grab some sphagnum moss as well as some coconut fiber. In this case, I'm using Eco Earth. Next, I mixed up the sphagnum moss with the coconut fiber. This mixture will be applied to the background along with the cork bark to give it a more naturalistic look. An hour has passed and now the silicone is dry to the touch. Now it is time for the expanding foam. This is the pond and stone variety and it is waterproof. This foam is colored black and thus it will blend better into the backdrop. The reason silicone was applied first is to give texture to the expanding foam to adhere to. And this is my first time doing this method so we'll see how it turns out. I took inspiration from ever evolving exotics for this method. Here I am applying the expanding foam onto the silicone 
making sure to fill up the entire background. Next, I grab the cork bark flats from earlier and firmly place them into the still wet foam. Then I spread the foam along the edges of the cork pieces in order to further lock them into the background. Here I am making sure to fill up any open spaces around the cork or on the background with foam to get an even covering. After all the foam was applied, I gently pressed the sphagnum moss and cocoa fiber mixture from earlier into the still wet foam. This mixture has to be completely dry in order for it to stick into the foam. So I had to do this process quickly while the foam is still wet. Now that the construction of the background is complete, it is time to close up the enclosure and lock it. As well as clean up my huge mess I made. The background needs time to completely dry but I can't move it so it has to stay where it is. So I placed a gate over it so these two hooligans don't mess with it. I left the enclosure to dry overnight and I removed the gate. So let's see how it turned out. First I lifted the enclosure upright very carefully. Next, I shook off all the excess sphagnum moss and cocoa fiber that didn't stick into the foam. After all the excess moss and cocoa fiber is shook off, the naturalistic background is complete. The expanding foam is a little noticeable because not all of the cocoa fiber stuck into the foam, but the cork is very solid. Now it's time to clean up the moss and the cocoa fiber. After the backdrop was finished, I picked up the enclosure and carried it back to my room. I have a perfect spot on my dresser already cleared off for the enclosure. I placed it in the center of the dresser and this enclosure is now the centerpiece of my bedroom. I set the tank on a foam mat to protect the glass on my dresser as well as distribute the weight of the tank. Next it is time for the lighting. I have this aquarium light and an automatic timer. This newer aquarium LED light has its own timer and is slimmer than the previous model that I am using for my other bioactive setups. Now that the LED light is on the enclosure, it is time to plug it in. On this timer, you can adjust the specific times you want the light to be on. I set it to turn on at 7 a.m. and turn off at 7 p.m. for a 12 hour photo period. Let's plug it in and test the LED light. There we go. Now we have some bright lighting for the enclosure. Next, it is time for the false bottom layer. I have two bags of hydroton and this is what I normally use for my false bottoms. However, before I add the false bottom, it is important to rinse the clay balls because they are often very dusty. So a strainer is quite useful in rinsing the hydroton of any dust or debris. I'm using hot water from my sink to thoroughly clean the hydroton off. Once the hydroton is rinsed off, there should be no more dust or debris remaining. Next, I poured the clean hydroton balls into a larger tub for later. I used the entire first bag of the Hydroton and now that it is all rinsed off, we can start adding the false bottom layer to the bottom of the enclosure. This layer of Hydroton acts as a drainage layer for any excess water that is in the substrate. It also prevents the plants from drowning and rotting. 
This layer should be around 1 to 2 inches in depth, so in this case, more is needed. I have an additional half a bag of Hydroton here that I already rinsed off. Now that this layer is complete, it is time for the next step. Here I have some window screen mesh that will be perfect for a substrate barrier. This mesh will lay on top of the false bottom layer and prevent any substrate from falling into the hydroton. But first we need to cut the mesh to size. Here I use the packaging to measure the size the mesh should be. However, it is important to keep the mesh a little bigger than the dimensions of the tank. This is so you can have a thick substrate layer without any substrate falling out of the barrier. It also allows you to trim the mesh if it is too large and won't fit. In my case, I had to trim the mesh a couple times until I got the perfect size. I then placed the mesh on top of the hydroton and made sure it was even on all sides. As you can see, the mesh is coming up the same distance on every side, almost acting like a basket. The next step is to mix up the bioactive substrate. First I have some leftover isopod substrate from Josh's Frogs. I dumped it into the empty tub. Next I have some exoterra substratum. This soil is collected at the bottom of volcanoes in Japan. It is nutrient rich, has live beneficial bacteria, is porous, and keeps the terrarium clean and healthy. Next, I have some sphagnum moss. This will help retain humidity. I added a good amount because this enclosure needs to be humid for the tropical plants as well as the gecko. Next up, I have some charcoal, also known as activated carbon. This will help remove impurities from the air and water, as well as prevent mold growth. Here I added 3 cups. Next I have some potting soil. However, I am only using 1 cup because this soil does have some fertilizer in it. Fertilizer can be harmful to animals, so that's why I kept it light with only 1 cup. I then mixed up the soil a little bit and had a couple bags of mixed substrate from previous projects that I added to the mixture, as well as some extra sphagnum moss. Once all of the materials were added, I made sure to thoroughly mix up the substrate. Now the substrate can be added onto the substrate layer. I am making sure to place the substrate evenly throughout the enclosure to create a nice layer of soil. I also made sure to line up the substrate with the background. As you can see, the substrate slopes up toward the back of the enclosure. This gives the enclosure more depth and creates a dynamic looking setup. I didn't end up using all of the substrate, but that's alright. Now that the soil layer is in place, I'll give the tank a quick spray down to keep the soil from drying out. Next, it is time to hardscape. I have a few manzanita branches here that I will be using. Here I am trying to configure the branches into a position that I like. This took a while, but I did end up with this. The branches are pretty stable, so I won't have to worry about them falling or locking them into place. Next I have this custom made coconut bridge. I figured she would enjoy it since she is always hiding and sleeping in her coconut hide. This coconut is a great size for an adult crested gecko and I got this from Etsy and it's very well made. It also came with suction cups to attach to the sides of the glass enclosure. The bridge is made out of bamboo and connected by mossy green paracord.
This coconut bridge elevates the setup and I love how it turned out. The next step is to prepare the plants for the enclosure. I have a good selection of plants sitting on my mini fridge, absorbing the sunlight from my window. First, the plants need to be taken out of the pot and the soil should be gently removed without harming the roots. Once the soil is removed, the roots should be gently rinsed with water to remove the rest of the soil. Now we should have a plant with mostly roots. This process of cleaning the plants is very important because it removes any harmful materials from the soil that the plants were growing in. Now it is time to start planting the enclosure. Let's start with this lemon button fern. I placed it in the back right corner of the enclosure. Next I have this Dracaena Janet Craig. This plant will provide a great hiding spot for the gecko once the leaves grow a little bit larger. I planted it in the front left corner of the enclosure. Next I have this umbrella plant. This is a very unique looking plant and should fill up most of the overstory. I planted it in the back center of the enclosure. Next I have this philodendron living in a cup of water. This plant is hardy and easy to grow so it should hopefully take up most of the enclosure like the umbrella plant. I placed it in the back left corner of the enclosure. Next up I have this beautiful peperomia. I planted this peperomia in the foreground to provide an appealing pop of texture and color. Another colorful plant that I used is this pink nerve plant. I split it into two pieces and placed them in the middle ground. Next I went into my dart frog vivarium to steal some plants. I love the look of this creeping fig climbing up the background, so I took a couple trimmings to add to the gecko vivarium. I planted multiple cuttings throughout the enclosure in hopes of getting some vertical growth onto the background or the branches. Now that the enclosure is planted, it is important to give the plants a good spray down so their roots do not dry out. The next step is to add some leaf litter. Leaf litter provides food and shelter for beneficial organisms living in the soil. It also acts as a protective layer for soil conditions as well as give my gecko some security to hide in. I made sure to create an even layer of leaves across the soil floor. Next I went into my dart frog vivarium again to grab some java moss. As you can see this moss is growing everywhere so it won't hurt if I take a little bit. I placed the moss throughout the enclosure but it may not grow because this enclosure won't be nearly as moist as the dart frog enclosure but it's worth a shot. The enclosure is fully planted and has a nice layer of leaf litter, but we need to make it fully bioactive and add the cleanup crew. First, I will be using my springtails that I culture myself. Springtails are tiny arthropods that eat dead organic matter, mold, and fungi. They are essential for creating a healthy and natural ecosystem. They reproduce very quickly and are very easy to culture. I am transferring the springtails by simply watering the culture and gently pouring them into the enclosure. Next, I will be using some isopods for my cleanup crew as well. These are powder orange isopods and they are a stunning bright orange color. Like springtails, isopods also break down dead organic matter. The cleanup crew also creates fertile soil 
for the plants from their feces. These guys are super cute and are a fundamental addition to any bioactive terrarium or vivarium. I introduced the isopods to their new home, however I should have done this step earlier because it was a little tricky getting all of them into the enclosure. But I got most of them into the enclosure and they started exploring. So now that the enclosure has been brought to life, I'll give it another spray down to keep the plants, soil, and cleanup crew moist and hydrated. The enclosure looks amazing, but it's not quite complete. A thermometer and hygrometer is needed to measure the temperature and humidity of the enclosure. I placed it right here in the front so it is easily visible. I also have some silicone food and water dishes as well as a magnetic feeding ledge. The dishes fit perfectly into the feeding ledge and with that, the bioactive Crested Gecko Vivarium is complete. Well, not quite. What about the gecko? Okay, the tank is completely done, so we're just gonna let it um, establish and grow out for about a month, and then we can finally add the Crested Gecko, and I'm super excited for that. So, stay tuned for that video.